Hey there, welcome to this week's episode of Bloomerang TV. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm super excited today. I've got my pal uh, Brady Josephson. He's joining us from uh, our beautiful neighbor to the north, Canada. Hey there, Brady. How's it going? Hey, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Brady, man, you're all over the place. You write for Huffington Post. You write for HubSpot. You've got your, your own consultancy. You work for a really cool technology company. Um, if you cannot take up you know, a half hour talking about all the stuff you do, uh, let people know who you are and, and what you're up to these days. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it, it's increasingly hard to define. So I, I'm, I'm a charity guy. I'm trying to find solutions that can kind of grow the charitable pie. And um, that's been a journey from working for a charity and then working for technology companies and doing some consulting kind of on the side. I also teach at North Park University in Chicago. Oh. So today I spend most of my days trying to build partnerships with charities and organizations to raise more funds in North America. Very cool. And tell us about CHIMP because this is a really unique... Uh, sort of a crowdfunding platform, uh, technology company. What's what does Chimp do? What are you guys up to there? Yeah, I mean that that could be its own <laughs> session. I mean, at, at its root, Chimp is a democratized donor advised fund. So anyone in Canada, we're just in Canada right now, mm -hmm. but anyone in Canada can have their own fund where they can give into an account and send it out to any registered charity at any point. But what we've built on top of that is different kind of um, tools. So there's fundraising tools or personal fundraising tools, and they look similar like crowdfunding pages or peer fundraising pages. But because we've used the Donor Advice Fund, people can kind of use their page over and over for different causes. They can give to different campaigns. They can um, get matched by their employers. So it's slowly evolving into more of an ecosystem where you can kind of do all of your charitable giving and all your charitable impact in one place, which is kind of unique if we can succeed. In yeah, it. it's really unique. I have I don't think anyone else is doing anything like it. Um, and 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 if I'm if I'm characterizing or describing this incorrectly, tell me, but you can gift funds from, from your fund to another person and that person can give it to the charity of their choice. Isn't isn't that is that did I describe that correctly? <laughs> That's absolutely correct. Yeah, and I actually I gave you a gift, I think. Yeah. Really send it to any charity. Yeah, it's called our peer to peer gift. And so we've, we've built some tools where companies use that. So instead of you know, giving their uh, customers a crappy bottle of wine at the end of the year, they mm -hmm. can give them a charitable donation of you know, 25, 50, whatever. And then those people can give to a charity they care about. And we're recently working on some point of sale devices. And so instead of you, know, you make a purchase and now the, the company will make a donation in your honor uh, to their charity, we're saying, whoa, 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 it's your money. Why don't they give you money and then you give it to the cause that you care about? Right. Again, it's all possible on the donor advised model, and we've, we're trying to build some, you know, cooler, accessible things on top of it. Yeah, it's really neat. I, I really enjoyed, you know, receiving the gift. It, it was, I, you know, no one ever given that to me, obviously before, because you're yeah. the only people doing it. But it was, it was super fun, you know, thinking about a Canadian charity that I wanted to give it to and sending it out. Um, yeah, really neat technology. Check that out. Um, just as an aside, but what I really want to talk to you about is, is crowdfunding and peer-to-peer. And -peer. You know, there's all these sort of, you know, I don't like to say buzzwords, but it kind of is a buzzword these days. Can you kind of cut through the noise and just really, really define in plain English, you know, what is crowdfunding? What is peer-to-peer? Because -peer? there's a lot of folks out there who, um, you know, still don't know what that is and definitely aren't taking advantage of it. Yeah, so I'll I'll try. I mean, for me, the definition around crowdfunding is just people rallying and networking their funds together to fund a project or a person. And what's funny about that is that's basically just fundraising. Yeah, <laughs> it's not that different. And and when I talk, I often lead with the story about the founding of Harvard University, which is essentially a old school crowdfunding story. Right. You know, we've been literally crowdfunding things in the charitable sector for hundreds of years, but because our for profit for-profit brethren are now, you know, using crowdfunding to fund things like arts and films and increasingly technology and companies, then now it is this kind of buzzword and, you know, in the charitable sector saying, whoa, 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 what is this and how do we do it? And, you know, the irony is, again, you know, we've been doing this longer than anyone. Right. So I, I, I try to talk about social fundraising, which encompasses both crowdfunding, which is more project-based and specific. It's often driven by an organization. You know, we're raising $50,000 for a orphanage in Uganda or something. It's very specific, very tangible, and project-based that people can then give to or potentially fundraise for. And then there's peer fundraising, which is either the older kind of traditional model where it's event-based, you know, walkathon, bikeathon, you know, I'm support me in this race, or that's kind of common. 
And now there's this newer offshoot that's kind of, you know, the charity water-ish model where people are giving up their birthdays or doing their own fundraisers on their own or ALS Ice Bucket Challenge would be kind of in that, you know, um, non-event-based fundraising. So to me, that's kind of peer proud as kind of project, but in reality, they're, they're increasingly overlapping, which makes it really hard to define. So that's how you would draw the distinction? Because I, I feel like some people use peer-to-peer -peer and crowdfunding sort of interchangeably, but it sounds like that's not really correct. Is, is that fair to say? Well, I mean, correct. I mean, that's my own definition, or it's one of the ways that we have kind of tried to define things, because if you don't define it, now we're talking about, I mean, a peer funding, peer to peer strategy and a crowdfunding strategy have huge overlap, but they are yeah. a bit different, in my opinion, right? One, you're purposely going for people to fundraise on your behalf, and the other one, you're purposely trying to create this really ripe giving opportunity. So, in one, the ask is a donation, and the other one is to fundraise. So they're, they're similar, you know, raising funds from the crowd, grassroots focus, story social, et cetera. But for, for me and for us, we try to make a little delineation just to try to provide some clarity to the conversation. But, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, I've seen them interchange a lot. So Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I don't really think they are interchangeable. I think that distinction is really helpful and, and definitely correct. Um, and it's interesting you say how, you know, nonprofits, people have been fundraising this way forever, but now it seems like in the last, you know, two, five, ten years even, we have this, like, technological renaissance that has really enabled it on a larger scale. Can you kind of talk about that and, and how that sort of changed the game for people? Yeah, so uh, I think the technology and social media has really just democratized information, right, the ability to create information and access information, and I think in, in fundraising that's done two main things. One, uh, you can find and access charities way easier now than you ever could before. It used to be a very, very, very ask-driven um, industry where, you know, a charity that has a lot of money and a lot of, um, you know, lists and emails and whatever can find you and ask, and that's how you find out about them. But increasingly, you know, you can go on GuideStar and Charity Navigator, and in Canada, Chimp, we have every registered charity has a profile page with some information on them. Cool. So you can find them and actually give to them without them even knowing what's going on. So the discovery side of charities, we're still way behind, but it's there, so you can find charities. But on the other end, it's it's the whole, the cost of transaction online, you know, allows things like a grassroots mass strategy to actually be cost effective, where in the past when we're dealing with paper and mail, it just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And then also there's a, a sharing component, right? So I often um, talk about a crowdfunding process, kind of like direct mail on steroids, where in the past, you write this great appeal, and you know you send it to someone. They open it up, and they're inspired, and they say, "Oh, this is great! You know, I'm going to give." But you know, what would they do? Say, "Oh, I want my neighbors to find out. Let me, you know, zip to Kinkos and make some copies, and then hand them out to the neighborhood." Like it just doesn't happen. But now we can have those types of asks that happen in real time. You can easily share it in your networks. You can pass things on, and it's really kind of leveling the playing field. And it's yeah. what allows an organization like Charity Water to be as big as it is, as fast as it is, built on the backs of small donors, right? It's yeah. really that technology revolution for sure. It's, it's an exciting time, especially for smaller nonprofits that maybe were locked out of some of those things just be based on budget and manpower. Yeah. Um, and I, I know we you know, we work a lot with a lot of smaller nonprofits, and I, and I, I think that some of them are starting to kind of feel left behind. They, they see all these things that you're talking about, but don't really know how to get into them, how to get started with them. What would you what kind of advice would you give to a small nonprofit, maybe even a newer nonprofit, who sees all this happening and is maybe sort of feeling like they're getting left behind. Um, they want to get into it. How can they get into it? Yeah, that's a it's a good question and it's a tough question. Right? <laughs> Most of the the consultancy and knowledge base that we have in the sector comes from higher ed, hospital, big organizations, traditional organizations which is really, for the most part, irrelevant to small organizations and new organizations. So for a, for a lot of organizations, one of the things we, we say, especially if you're new and, and kind of have a younger-ish, we're talking like 40 and below maybe as your core focus, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, digital first is the, the core, right? So don't even bother with things like a direct mail strategy and these kind of things. Like get ahead of the curve on where things are at now, right? Don't try to play catch up with the things that have been going on. And when it comes to crowdfunding, again, we, we really try to draw the parallels between, look, you've been doing this. Your direct mail appeals, your annual fund, whatever it is, it, you're setting a goal, right? You're reaching out to people. You're making an ask and an offer. It's the same thing, just in a different 
uh, kind of technology or form. Right. Form actually has a lot of you know upside and things that you couldn't couldn't do in the past. So if we can kind of translate you know what people know to be good fundraising and just reapply it into these newer things, whether it's social media or crowdfunding or peer to peer, you know it's it's the concepts that still apply. So maybe a, a good way to end is, you know, I guess what I want to know is where can people really find good information about this? And I'm talking about like best practices, case studies, examples, so that if they want to do it, they're not just sort of flying blind. Is, are there any resources out there or, or places that you know of where people can really learn you know, how to do this um, in an effective way? Yeah. Uh, generally, that, that knowledge and information comes from platform and providers, right? So mm -hmm. us at Champion, we have another company called Peer Giving that kind of builds crowdfunding and peer fundraising into websites. Uh, like, we do some of that ourselves uh, in the U.S. Uh, Classy used to be Stay Classy. They yeah. have some great resources and information and know a lot about this. Causevox is another one that has good stuff. Basically, any of them, CrowdRise, Rezu, Fundly, all those organizations that do this have a lot of that information and a lot of those kind of best, best practices. So the only caveat would be some of them are, are for-profit and non-profit, and those are you know, pretty different strategies at times. So be sure that you're looking at one that's really focused on nonprofit or, or mm -hmm. charity. And then also make sure, you know, what I really like about Classy is they, they seem to get fundraising, but they understand what it means for crowdfunding and peer fundraising. Some startups and technology just go, oh, crowdfunding's the best, and this is how you should do it, and they don't actually understand the intrinsic motivations behind donors, which is different than investing in a company or trying to buy a watch or something. How do you pick those out? Because there's a lot of vendors. You know, you just listed a lot of really excellent ones. You know, Causevox is great, Classy. Obviously, you want people to check out Chimp. Um, Funly is a good one. But like you said, there are other ones where it just feels like it was kind of a startup and kind of a fly night by night thing, and people maybe saw an opportunity to, to create that technology. How do you how do you identify who are the really reputable providers? Because there are so many, and it seems like there's a new one every hour. I feel like I see a new one. <laughs> yeah, I saw something that said there's over like 600 different platforms now. Oh. This you know just in North America alone or something like that. So I, I'd say one. I mean, just looking at the website um, and they're kind of featured projects. Uh, often they'll showcase a few of their featured projects, and if those are charities, then it's probably more of a charity-centric platform. They often have resources, and sometimes they'll just call out nonprofits or for charities. Uh, or if you get into contacting them or emailing them, just ask them, you know, can you tell me a few examples of how charities are using this platform, or nonprofits specifically are using this platform? Because there's a lot of things that are not charitable at, at law that are getting funded, right? You know, yeah. you fell ill and you needed some funds for, I hope you don't, but if you fell ill and you were needing funds, you know, I could donate to you in a non-charitable way uh, legally, but that's charity, you know, yeah. you need, I'm helping you. And so that's, that's what's going to be interesting for me in the next 10, 15 years where our definition of charity, which has come down from a legal perspective and a tax perspective, is really becoming, you know, less and less relevant for the motivations of, of millennials and down of what they want to do. It doesn't matter if it's charity and I get a tax receipt as much as I want to do something good. Yeah, so that'll be a big challenge for charities, I think, to try to keep up and for the administrations to kind of define that or expand their definition or not. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, and I know you're keeping an eye on it. Um, where can people find uh, your writings, you, you know, you got you got excellent blog posts out there. Um, you write for for huge publications. I want people to read those. Where can people learn more about you and follow you online? Sure. So I, I do all of my stuff in one way or another at ReCharity. So ReCharity.ca. So if it's posted somewhere else on Huffington Post or Champ or uh, HubSpot, wherever it is, I try to at least link to it. So that's kind of the central hub. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Brady Josephson. So that's where I'll share a lot of that stuff. And then we, we have a growing uh, blog at Chimp, blog.chimp.net, which has a lot of good resources, and we're doing our own webinars, and we've talked about doing something similar to Bloomerang TV, so we're yeah. copying you there. <laughs> That's okay. I copied it from somebody. So I'm... Yeah, exactly. There we go. <laughs> well, cool. We'll link to all that stuff. Definitely follow Brady. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, this was awesome having you. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to chat with us. Thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me. Sure. All right. And thank you uh, for watching. We'll catch you again next week with another episode. Uh, we'll talk to you uh, then. Bye now.